Hey, good morning. How is everybody this morning? Nice and cool outside, isn't it wonderful? Uh, well, we welcome you to Second. We're glad you're here. If you're joining us online, we welcome you as well. If you have your Bibles, and of course we hope you do, take them out and turn to the book of Acts. Book of Acts, we're going to be in chapter 1. And uh, as you just heard Dave say, and also the intro video, uh, we are in a series of messages during the month of July titled Mission Me. And we really have one goal behind this whole series of messages, and it's this right here. It is, what is the mission of God, and how do we live that out? I mean, really, what is God's mission for us as a church, but also for us as individuals, but not just know what that mission is, but also live out that mission? And so throughout this series, our goal is to challenge you as individuals, to challenge you as family units, that you would engage your life to be on mission with God. If you weren't here last week, I want to remind you of something that Jeremy said last week. He said, if you're going to live on mission, then you need to zoom out so that you can focus in. But then he changed it. He turned it around and he said, we need to focus in so that we can zoom out. And that's what I want to do today, specifically with the passage of Scripture that we're looking at. I, I want us to really focus in so that hopefully it'll cause us to zoom out our thought process on being on mission with God. So let's look at it, specifically one verse Acts chapter 1, verse 8, and it says this, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now last week, Jeremy opened up this series talking about the idea that Yes, we receive power. It's not just doing this in our own power and own strength, but that God promises to give us power within, but that also we're to be witnesses. But where? Where should be witnesses? The question is this, where am I to be on mission? I mean, a lot of times when we hear about missions, we immediately begin thinking about overseas. We begin thinking about trampling through the jungles or out in the desert or in some third world country. And so oftentimes our mind goes that direction. And for those that have never done a trip like that, we begin thinking that we have a kind of a, a walk. We, we, we're not necessarily called to go overseas. So I guess I have a walk on this idea about being on mission. But if you look at this passage that we just read, this particular thing that Jesus said turned the world upside down on his followers, specifically his disciples. Because if you think about it, they're sitting there listening to this and they had to be shook to their core because Jesus says, first of all, you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem was the place where they had just witnessed Jesus be crucified. That didn't seem like a really great place to do missions. But he said, he said you're going to be in Jerusalem, you're going to be in Judea. Judea was the one place that they had been rejected more often than any other place. Then he said to Samaria, you remember, you know, hopefully you know, the Jews' opinion of Samaritans. They were the lowest of the low. They were the scum of the earth. And Jesus is saying that we're going to be witnesses to the people we don't even want to hang out with. We're going to be witnesses to the people we don't even want to do dinner with. That doesn't make sense. And then ultimately, he says, and to the other ends of the earth, or to the end of the earth, or the, as your Bible may say, the uttermost parts of the earth. Well, that, for those guys that day, would think, wait a minute. He's talking about the Gentiles? The Gentiles? We, we got to be witnesses to the Gentiles? I don't, I don't really know that we want them in on this because they'll probably mess it up in the first place. And so, in my opinion, as we all think about what Jesus says in this short verse, 
You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth. Somehow, this ought to have a way of shaking us at our core. But today, I want to focus on one location that Jesus talked about, and that location is Jerusalem. Now, again, some of you are thinking, man, I've never been to the Holy Land. I don't have any plans on going to the Holy Land. I would love to go to the Holy Land, but I don't know if I would ever want to go over there. It's so unstable. I, I, so I guess I don't have to worry about Jerusalem. Well, I think you've probably heard this before. I know I have most Bible scholars and most pastors, preachers, teachers always equate the idea of Jerusalem as being the place that you call home. In other words, the place where you live. So if Jesus were using present day language, talking to us today, maybe his words might sound like this. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Baytown. Or maybe you live in Mont Bellevue or Highlands or Crosby, wherever you live. You're going to be my witnesses in that place. You're also going to be my witnesses in all of Texas. And then ultimately the United States and then to the rest of the world. You see, I believe that our witness needs to begin where we live. Jerusalem. Baytown, Highlands, Mont Bellevue, Crosby, wherever it is. It needs to begin there. And if we're going to be on mission with God in our lives, we have to decide that being on mission is not always flying halfway around the world. But maybe it's right where you are right in this moment. So I want to get real practical with this thought process today. If we're to be witnesses in Jerusalem, and if Jerusalem represents where we live, what does that look like? And I've got four thoughts I want to share with you. First is this. You should be on mission in your home. You should. Not you might be, you could be. No, you should be on mission in your home. I think all of us, Realize this, but the traditional home, the traditional family is under attack in our world today. The Bible is very clear about what marriage is supposed to look like. The Bible is very clear, also very clear on the tenure of marriage. The Bible is clear on the roles and responsibilities of husbands and wives and dads and moms. And I'm not trying to offend anyone today, but when we start messing with the Creator's plans and intentions, then we begin asking for problems. You know, uh, for Father's Day, uh, Susan asked me, what do, you, what do you want for Father's Day? And I, you know, I don't really, uh, I'm, not, I'm not super fancy. <laughs> I think that's pretty obvious. And, uh, but I said, hey, uh, my watch... Uh, the light on my watch, I don't wear a high dollar watch, this is a Timex, Iron Man. Um, I said, the light on my watch went out. Can I, can I get a new watch? She's like, oh, I guess so, you know. So she, uh, sure enough, on Father's Day, I, I, I get a new watch. And I mean, my, my, which by the way, this is my old one. I'm about to get to the story. This is my old one. I get a new one for Father's Day. I had it a week. And one week after I got it on Father's Day, which would have been last Sunday, I took a little afternoon nap, maybe. I wake up and I look at my watch and it's just blank. No numbers, no nothing, just blank. I'm like, what in the world? You know, I'm pushing on the buttons, nothing happened. I'm like, well, that's kind of crazy. Maybe, maybe the battery went out. That's, that's probably what happened. And I wonder if you can change the batteries on these pretty cheap watches, or even if it's worth it. So what do you do? You YouTube it, of course. And sure enough, you can. So I start watching the YouTube deal. You have to take off the band. You have to take off the back of the watch, which has these itty bitty little bitty screws. Men, y'all remember the tools we gave you on Father's Day? Broke mine out, baby. I used it. 
I got those itty bitty screws out, got the back off, and then there was this latch that held the battery on, and there was even a more itty bitty screw on that that was more itty bitty than the other screws. And I finally got that one off, got that off, get the battery out, and I'm like, yeah, we don't have one of these. So a couple of days later, I stop by Walgreens, I get the battery, I go home, I'm, I'm feeling very confident. I put the battery in, I start putting it all back together, which was an interesting process. And I, I got most of it back together, and it should at that, you know, it's upside down, I haven't looked at it yet, and I'm thinking it, it should be on. I was getting frustrated because I couldn't get some of the parts back like I wanted them to, and I flip it over, it's still dead. Just dead, dead as a door, doorknob. I mean, just dead. And then, to make matters worse, I couldn't even get everything back together on it. Needless to say, I'm, I'm wearing the old watch, and the new one went somewhere it needed to go, I guess. <laughs> you see, I, I wasn't the creator of that watch. And as much as I wanted to YouTube it and think that I could do something to make it work, my efforts and my abilities were not enough to make it work. You see, God was the originator of the home. God is the originator of marriage. And God is the original idea of how we should raise our kids. And when we start thinking that his ways are no longer culturally relevant, or when we start thinking that his ways are outdated or old-fashioned, and we don't follow the plan of the creator, we're asking for trouble. So I would like to share some practical ideas on how you can be on mission in your home. Husbands. Husbands. Love your wife like Christ loved the church. He was willing to give his life for the church. He sacrificed everything about himself for the church. That's how we as husbands are supposed to love our wives. Wives, respect your husbands. Doesn't say put up with them, try to change them, make them what you think they ought to be and behave how you think they ought to behave. No, it says respect your husbands. If you had a problem with that, I'm sorry. That's from scripture in Ephesians. It's just very clear. I realize that there are some things that happen within a marriage relationship that are sometimes out of our control. And I realize that sometimes people do things that destroy trust and commitment. But if we're going to be on mission with it in our home, it begins with us as husbands and wives fostering, nurturing, and growing that relationship. Growing it. And for those of you who are not married... Sorry, you don't get a walk today. Even though you may not have a spouse that you're doing life with, you can still be very intentional with your home and the relationships that you have surrounding that home, whatever relationships they may be. And I remind you, I remind you, sometimes I know this is difficult and I realize I've never walked down that path, but you know, the Bible actually affirms people in their singleness. And that it's actually a blessing from God in, in the potential of ministry. But beyond marriage, beyond marriage, the other, there are other potential relationships with, within your home. You may or may not have children. You may or may not have extended family living with you. You may or may not have roommates or renters or the list could go on and on. But my encouragement to you is that you need to be intentional in those relationships. You can be on mission with God within your own home. Parents, if you want to be on mission with God in your home, then might I remind you that you are the primary teacher of godly things. It's not the church's responsibility to make your kids godly. It's yours. We're just your support group. We're just your, hey man, I need some help or I need some encouragement or whatever, but you are the one that ought to be leading out in your home. 
teaching your children, instructing them in the ways of the Lord. I hope, I hope, at a minimum, I hope if you have kids in your home that you're praying with them daily. And I don't mean over the meal. I mean actually praying with them. I shared with you, you know, Susan and I are not perfect by any means. But if there's one thing that we've always been consistent on is every night when we put our kids in bed, we, we lean over them and pray over them. We pray that God will change their hearts and their lives, that Jesus would pursue them and that they would ultimately pursue Jesus with their lives. And it's, it's really gotten to a point where now, I'll just be honest with you, some nights we sit on a bed, I know you're never this way, but I'll, I'll confess, I'm so frustrated with them, I want to beat them before I put them in bed. And then I get them in bed and I storm down the stairs and I hear, you didn't pray with me. Oh, I'll come pray with you. God, pour out judgment. No, I don't do, I don't do that. I hope maybe you're having some kind of family devo with your kids. You know, we used, uh, you, you've heard me talk, we go to family camp every year. We've been doing it for 25, 26 years. And every morning we, uh, we have a family devo that they provide for us. And the guy, men in the room, can I just talk to you? They challenge all the men that are there, dads that are there. Some may go to church, some may not go to church. And they, they say to them, you know what, you're the father you ought to be leading this time. Guys, be on mission in your home. There's way too many tools out there. You go, I, I, don't, I don't know what to do. Get, get, get on Amazon and type in family devotional books, kids devotional books, and you will see so much stuff that wouldn't cost you hardly anything. And all you got to do is read it to them. Be on mission. Be intentional in that. Can I remind you? Can I remind you what uh, God spoke to the children of Israel as they were moving out in Deuteronomy? And he says this to them in Deuteronomy 11. He said, you shall therefore lay up these words of mine in your heart. Speaking of his words, you lay up for them in your heart and in your soul. And you shall bind them as, as a sign on your hand. And they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. Listen, guys. Gals, you shall teach them to your children, talking of them when you are sitting in your house and when you're walking by the way and when you lie down and when you rise, you shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates that your, listen, if you do it, that your days and the days of your children may be multiplied in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers to give them as long as the heavens are above the earth. For if you will be careful to do this commandment that I command you to do, loving the Lord your God, walking in all of his ways, and holding fast to him, then, then the Lord will drive out all the nations before you and will dispose uh, and, and, and you will dispose nations greater and mightier than you. Maybe your home is in turmoil right now. And I just wonder, where is God in that? Or have you allowed him to intervene in that? What do your kids know about your walk with God. How are you teaching them in that? Do they believe that you believe a relationship with God is one of the most important things that they could ever have? So be on mission with God in your home. Secondly, you should be on mission at church. You should be on mission at church. This might come as a surprise to some of you, but church is not a spectator sport. It's not. The church is not the building. The church is not the pastors and the staff. The church is not a name or a denomination. No, the church is you. It's you. So many people want to blame the church for not doing this for them or doing that for them. 
Some people want to talk about how the church is very cliquish, and, and I could go on and on and on and on. Yes, yes, I would agree that sometimes there are times when the church fails. Trust me, I know this, because I was a pastor's kid. I sat in plenty of business meetings where I listened to people rip my dad up one side and down the other and talk about how horrible he was. So yes, I know the church can be hurtful. There is no perfect church. No perfect church. This place is not perfect. Why? Because it's full of imperfect people. Which, by the way, you as the complainer, if you are, you're imperfect as well. But folks... I think you will get out of church as much as you are willing to put into it. We talk about volunteering up here all the time. I honestly don't know how many volunteers it takes every Sunday for us to have these two services every Sunday. But it takes a lot of volunteers. Volunteers in our kids area, volunteers in our youth area, volunteers in this room, volunteers out on the parking lot. I mean, it takes a ton of volunteers every Sunday for us to be able to do church. But I do know this. The number of volunteers it takes is only a fraction of the number that's in this room right now. And so... We shouldn't be calling for volunteers. We shouldn't be asking for volunteers. Why? We're the church. We, we are the church. I, I think you know, and I believe this, it doesn't make you more spiritual just to come to church. It doesn't make you more spiritual to get up off the couch at home and actually come back to church. But church attendance does impact your life personally. It impacts the lives of your family around you. What kind of example are you setting? And then, I don't know if you realize this, but your church attendance impacts other people that aren't even part of your family in ways that you don't even know about. I think that's why there's a challenge in Hebrews that says, don't, don't forsake that time together. Make it a priority. Be on mission in your church by being there and volunteering and serving and making the church what it needs to be. You need the church. Your family needs the church. And the church needs you. Third thing, what's another part of Jerusalem? You should be on mission at work. You should be on mission at work. Now, I realize this is a tough one because I work at a church. So you go, you don't, you don't even know, Tommy, and you're, you're right. I, I probably, I don't know everything that you deal with within a secular work society. I fully understand that there are some workplaces that frown on any kind of religious practices or talking about religious things. But I also realize that sometimes you even work in um, a situation where if you start any kind of spiritual conversation, man, uh, the pot gets stirred and the voices get loud and people start talking harsh. So you might need to be creative on how you be on mission within your workplace. Let me tell you an easy place to start being on mission in your workplace it's the easiest thing you can do. Show up on time. Do your work. Don't be that one, right? Don't be that one. Because I promise you, if you are that one, and you know what I'm talking about, the lazy one, the late one, the one that always has excuses for never accomplishing what they're supposed to be doing, I, I promise you, if you're that one and... Everybody in there knows you're some kind of church person. They're labeling you and they're labeling everybody else in this room. So just begin. Begin by showing up on time. Begin by doing your work and being the best employee you can be. But I also challenge you because I know there are some in this room that have done this in a secular workplace. Begin a prayer time. 
with some people. Maybe even a Bible study. Uh, I'll never forget several years ago when we were challenging people to be in, on mission and, and we were talking specifically about our fall spiritual journey and we even said maybe you ought to think about starting a small group in your workplace and there was a guy in our church named Matt Riffle and Matt took that challenge and he went to work and he went to his boss and he said hey I don't know if this is feasible or if I can do this but can I use the break room to have a, a small group Bible study we won't take more than the lunch hour I'll just invite people. They don't have to come, or if they want to come, they can come. And he presented to his boss. Boss is like, yeah, sure, whatever. And that year, Matt filled up the break room, or conference room. I forget exactly where it was. And it grew so much that over, over the years, he kept having to add more groups and more groups at the same place. Why? Because he had the guts to just ask. He had the guts to step out and be on mission within his workplace. Think of a creative way that you can be on mission at work. And then finally, and there's a lot more I could share, but finally, you should be on mission in your community. In your community. You know, we try and provide opportunities for you to serve right here in Baytown. You heard it a moment ago. I'm going to say it again. We've got a big deal coming up this Wednesday. We need your help. Every, every, every second Tuesday, we typically, every second Wednesday, sorry, not Tuesday, every second Wednesday, we, we go to the Bay Terrace Apartments and we, we pass out food. Do it. That's regular. Every, every month. But this, this week, we're going on Wednesday night and we're going to pass out the food, which normally takes about 20 to 25 volunteers but then we're going above and beyond. We're doing a block party. And there, there are going to be kids in this apartment complex that have never been a part of something like that. We need help with cooking hot dogs. We need help with people just standing at a bouncy house, making sure no one's killing one another, right? Playing games with kids. It, it's not all night long. It's an hour, hour and a half, two hours, I think, at the most. There's an opportunity right there for you to be on mission right here in your community. I think you probably saw the announcement. We're about to do a, a, a one-day partnership with Habitat for Humanity. I'm not a builder. A lot of that Habitat stuff is cleanup. Picking stuff up from the job site where the real workers do the work. We have people that serve in the Pregnancy Resource Center. We have people who serve with the Bay Area Homeless Shelter. And we've got a really cool opportunity coming up next month, but I can't tell you what it is yet. But a very simple opportunity next month that everybody could be involved in. And I hope you join in. So when we think about this idea of Jerusalem being where we live, can I just show you something? This is my Jerusalem right here. And this is also my Jerusalem next one and then this is also my Jerusalem and then this is my Jerusalem as well what's your Jerusalem you have been given power and you've been given a challenge your mission if you choose to accept it is Jerusalem God I thank you for today I thank you for the chance to be in your word and God uh, to be reminded that to be on mission with you doesn't involve getting on a plane or driving long distances but that we can be on mission with you right here where we live. May it begin within our home where we would foster and nurture and, and grow our marriage relationships. and God, where we would raise our children in a godly way, teaching them godly things. God, may it move to your church where we come on Sundays, but 
God, may it be more than just attendance. May we all be challenged to be involved in the local church. God, then in our workplace, I pray that you would put within our hearts a, a desire to see our coworkers come to know you as their Lord and Savior. And then God, in our community, you have us here for a purpose. Second Baytown does not exist for themselves, but we exist to lead people to Jesus Christ and to develop them into fully devoted followers of him. May we be on mission with you, Jesus, in our Jerusalem. We pray in Jesus' name.